Hi, everyone, um, and welcome to the Anaconda Virtual Environment Workshop. And once again, I want to thank you all for taking our time to sign up for this workshop. So uh, my name is Valentine Adwaka, and I am a graduate student here at NMSU studying computer science. And fortunately, this is my final semester, and I'm so glad about that. So currently, I work with a high-performance computing team here at NMSU as a graduate assistant. And um, I'm glad you guys are on board. So uh, the essence of this workshop is to introduce um, the benefits and use cases of Anaconda virtual environments on discovery. So, you know, as we all know, creating virtual environments with Anaconda gives you that ability to have a single or multiple custom environments for your project um, in order to meet several virtual requirements. So, um, Anaconda uses the Conda package manager to easily install software and associated packages. And also it supports like the Python and our projects, right? And many other applications as well. So um, we're gonna take a look at how we can use that on discovery, um, which is gonna consist of, you know, installing packages with Python PIP or Python PIP um, within your virtual environment and also, we'll take, a, uh, we'll take a look at how you can remove your virtual environment, um, delete it. We'll take a look at how you can clone your virtual environment. And also, um, finally, we will take a look at how you can use the Conda environment you created in your submission script. So that's the main thing to take out um, from this um, workshop. You know, how can I utilize the custom environments I just created in my submission script so that the HPC cluster, which is a high performance computing cluster we have here, can process it for you. So once again, welcome you all. Um, I know some of you here have, like, you guys are familiar with the Discovery, which is a high performance computer we have here on NMSU. But I know some other people are joining this workshop due to the fact that, you know, they have like a project they would like to work on and get to know more about um, Anaconda and how to use that on Discovery. And I welcome you all for that. So I hope you get the best out of this uh, workshop um, as we go along. So uh, looking at the objectives, we'll take a look at um, introduction to Anaconda, what Anaconda is and we'll take a look at the environments, the Conda environments we have on Discovery, and also how we could manage our custom Conda environments. All right, so, um, so basically Anaconda is a Python and R distribution, which actually aims at you know, providing everything you need for your data science tasks. You know, so it is basically a set of um, libraries or binaries that includes Skippy. I don't know if it's called Skippy or Skypy. And also it includes NumPy, Pandas, you know, alongside with all their dependencies, right? And then Condor is, um, you know, a package manager for Anaconda, which actually installs packages, which may contain software written in any language and it can install Python packages as well as Python interpreter directly. So um, basically, if you're working with like a web development tool like Node.js, um, the Node.js framework, um, it has its own package manager like NPM. So a package manager would be like um, a tool that software developers use um, in order to download other software or other tools developed by all other um, software developers in that large community. So that's what the package manager is. So um, taking a look at um, taking a look at of the benefits of Anaconda, um, it is the world's most popular data science platform for data scientists and IT professionals, and it is a distribution of Python and R, and it is quite free and open source, and makes package management easy and simpler for deployment. Um, it has several tools to easily collect data from sources using machine learning and AI. 
and also um, the anaconda is actually the industry um, it's actually the industry standard for developing testing and training on a single you know machine so what is the main purpose of creating um, a conda virtual environment so let's say um, you have two separate programs you know with each one of them using different versions of Python and other libraries, right? So given a situation like this, you know, rather than always modifying your program to meet several version requirements that your project depends on, you can create multiple virtual environments for each, you know, of these projects and to serve this purpose so as to keep things clean, you know, and efficient. So, um, so let's say um, I have two programs and each of these programs have um, one of the requirements for one of the programs is Python version um, version two and the other program the requirement is Python version three so instead of tweaking my code to always meet the several versions of Python I could just go ahead and create different virtual environments that are specifically built to suit each of these programs that I'm working on so that's the whole basic idea of creating uh, Python virtual environments. Um, so I have these two links where you could, if you don't have any idea about Anaconda and how to use it, um, you can use those links to get a glimpse of how, you know, what Conda is and how you can utilize it for your project. And um, this slide would definitely be uploaded at the hpc.nmsu.edu website. Um, Tina Brown, can you send a link? Drop the link for everyone. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Great. All right. So, um, before you start using the Condor environment on Discovery, we have several custom environments um, we created for. Um, students who specifically needed them for their projects. For example, we have like the soil systems, the red biome, and I think these guys were actually from the astronomy department. So, um, and then if you see the first condo environment we have here, we have like the asterisk on it. So this is the default um, environment you get logged into whenever you activate the condo package. So the first thing you want to do is to load the Anaconda module. Um, actually, it's going to be Anaconda 3 because that's the latest version. So module load Anaconda 3, and then you can list um, all the virtual environments we have using the Conda env list command, and it gives you this output. So let me quickly log in and do that real quick. Let's see. Okay, so quite so this is my home directory. And um, first thing I want to do is to load um, the Conda software. So if I do a module load Anaconda 3, my module has been loaded and I can do a module list, which shows me the list of active modules I have loaded in my environment. So now I can do a Conda env list to show me a list of virtual environments I have on the cluster. So by default, this is this is the environment I'm currently within. And these are all the list of um, virtual environments we have on this copy. So if you're working on um, a project that requires TensorFlow um, and has like a support for GPU nodes, um, you can you know load this environment. And I'm gonna show you how you can do that. So I created one environment called my R env. That's the first one, which points to my home directory right here, home via Dracker. And if if I want to activate that, I'm going to do a condor activate my underscore R env. All right. So when you do this, it prefixes your prompt with the name of the environment which shows that I am actively within this environment, right? And then I can run commands like conda um, list, which actually shows me 
of the list of libraries I installed within that environment. So these are the list of tools and packages I installed within this environment. Okay, so let me go back to the slide. So um, for the next um, objectives, we'll look at how we can create this conduct environment ourselves. Um, we'll, we'll also use um, like a, we'll write a, a small Python program for the purpose of you know this demonstration and then we'll look at how we can remove packages install packages with python pip um, exit a conda environment delete a conda environment clone an existing conda environment and also um, being able to utilize these created environments in our submission scripts all right so first thing we want to do is to load the anaconda which we did and also we can create the environment. And then there are two methods of creating a conda environment. We can use the first method, which only um, creates the environment without installing any packages. Or you could use the second one, um, which actually you know, specifies a given package to install while creating the environment. So that's this one we have right here, where we specified um, Python 3.6 during the creation of the environment. So after an environment is created, we want to activate the environment. And also we can show the list of packages installed within that environment. And I think now I can go ahead with, uh, let me show you how that works here. So I'm going to clear my console. Condo. Okay. Um, what do you purge? All right. So currently, I have no modules in my environment. I currently purge all the modules I have in my environment. So the first thing we want to do is to load module load anaconda three specifically. Now, if I do a module list. I can see um, that the Anaconda 3 module has been loaded. So now I can use the Conda environment to create my first environment. So um, based on the fact that we're going to work on a project called Camel Case, it's a sim simple Python program that capitalizes every first character of a given, of a given statement or a given sentence. So I'm going to use the Conda Conda create and pass the name of the environment, which is um, Camel case. And that's it. So it goes ahead to create my environment and then it sends, it creates this environment within my home directory in a hidden folder called Conda. And then you have environment and then the name of the environment. So I'll choose no, and then that's it. I'll clear my console for you guys to see. So right now I can do a conda env list. And now we can see that we just created this camel case environment. So um, for me to start installing packages within this environment, I need to activate it, right? So I'll do a conda activate camel case. And then it changes my prompt by prefixing the name of the environment to my um, regular prompt um, display. So if I run a conda list, um, it shows I have no um, packages or libraries installed yet. So um, our project we're going to work on is a Python project, obviously, and we need the Python interpreter and we need to add that package. We need to download it to this environment. And the way to do that is to do a conda install Python. Right, but before that, um, there are certain times you want to search for um, a list of packages just to see the different variants of, let's say, Python or our script, right? So I could, I could do like the conda search first, and then Python. 
so it stretches the channel and then it it prints the list of different variants of python um, software you could load so um i think i'm going to go with this version which is the latest version so now i can do the conda install python equal to the version um, name so it's installing and then it gets a list of of dependencies that you know that is that are accompanying um, um, libraries for the python package so i'm going to select yes and it's going to take a few minutes before it completes Right. And it's done. So let me clear up my console for you guys to see. So now I can do a condo list. And it shows us the list of packages we've installed in this environment. So um, the next thing we want to do is now that we have the Python interpreter, right? We want to install um, a Python library called um, the Camel case. So um, now I can use the Python pip installer for that, which is a local installation for Python. Right. So now I can do a pip. First, let me do a pip list. And these are the only uh, libraries we have, like the Python libraries we have. So I want to do a pip install Camel case. Okay, that has been installed. So if I do a pip list again, it shows me that yes, I have Camel case installed. So basically, like I said, Camel case just capitalizes every first character of give um, of every word in a sentence. So now I can activate my Python um, shell. And then I can start writing my code for it. So for example, I can do the import um, camel case. And then I can create a variable so I can use this camel case um, library. Okay, so call, I'm calling the camel case function. And then I'm gonna declare a variable in which I wanna apply the camel case function on. So I'm going to say creating my first um, anaconda env. Okay. Enter. And then I can print this c.hump. Okay. So that's the result. Right. So it was able to capitalize every first character of this sentence right here. And that's the result we got here, right here. So now we've successfully used, um, we've su successfully created our Conda environment, installed um, our Python library, and also installed like a local package um, for this environment. So the question is, now that we have this set, how can we utilize this in our batch script, in our submission script? Right, and how can we, you know, just tie it to our project and use everything seamlessly? So I'm going to exit from this shell prompt, and then um, I'm going to exit from this environment. And the, the command for that is the conda deactivate. So this takes me back to my default login shell. So if I do an ls. Um, so right now let's create um, our batch script, our program file, and you know, just creating our project. So I'm gonna do an MKDIR um, camel case project. I'll go into this camel case project. And then I'm gonna create two files. So I'm gonna create my Python script, which is my project. And then I'm going to create the submission script, which is what the compute nodes understand. So I'll use a touch, sorry about that, touch program.py, which is my Python script, and script.sh. 
which is my um, submission script. And after that, I would like to make my script executable, right? So that the compute nodes would see my script as an executable script. So I'm going to do script.sh, and there you go. So if I do an lsla, now I can see that, you know, I have two files, my program.py and this submission script. And with this last command here, I was able to change the operations of each and every group for this file, like the orders, the owner, and um, other users. So um, I'm going to go ahead to create our batch script, right? So the first thing we want to do is the shebang, the shebang command, uh, which actually tells our shell that, hey, I want you to treat this script as a shell executable script, right? So that's the first command. And the next um, step of um, parameters, um, we call them the resource request, right? So those are the S batch directives. So in the first parameter we want to specify is the job name, the name of the job. Oops. And we can set that equal to um, camel case. And then the next thing we want to specify is the output. You know, where, where exactly you know, are we going to send our outputs for this um, for this entire project? And now I'll say camel case dot out. Next, I want to specify the time. So the time basically is very important because um, whenever we want to submit our script, right? We want to let the scheduler, which is a slum scheduler know that, hey, this is the estimated time um, I think this script is going to run for. And with that information, the, the scheduler understands how to place you in the queue, you know, and it, it, this is more like, you know, the whole priority team, um, the whole priority team, like, where am I going to place this guy? So if Valentine has um, an estimated time of 10 minutes to execute his or script, and let's say, Mr. Wayne has um, one hour. And then Mr. Wayne actually submitted his script before my script. So um, the scheduler is just going to play a fair game and say, oh, okay, Valentine has 10 minutes and Mr. Wayne has one hour. I think I'm just going to let Valentine go, you know, since he has a lesser time. So that's why we recommend that you always specify the time parameter in your Sloan script. So I'm just going to give an estimated time of 10 minutes, although it's going to run less than that. And then next, I'm going to declare my tasks. Um, this is a parameter people find confusing. And the easiest way I can describe this is to say the end tasks actually means what are the number of things that I need to do, right? So currently, um, let's, let's say hypothetically, I am doing three things, right? I am washing um, dishes, I am um, doing laundry, and also I am doing my assignment. So these are three separate tasks, right? And it means that I can actually perform these tasks in parallel. So, um, and each of these tasks, I can assign resources to. I can say, okay, um, task one, I am washing dishes. I'm gonna assign one CPU and um, 100 gig of RAM. Task two, I'm doing my assignments. I'm going to assign one CPU and 50 gig of RAM. That's the way, that's the whole idea with the task uh, parameter here. So the next parameter I want to specify is the CPUs per task. Just as the name implies, how many CPUs do I want to allocate for each of the tasks I have to perform? And then next, I want to specify the memory per CPU. CPU, sorry. And that's going to be, I, I can say 1D, right? So um, so that, that is the resource request. And these are all the parameters we recommend people to have, like students to have. 
on India script. And um, for safety reasons, I'm just going to use, um, I'm going to add another parameter called the partition. Because currently we have most of the um, nodes being utilized by students. So um, if I make use of the backfill partition, this will give me access to the entire node and also allow me to you know, submit my job to all of the nodes um, at which I am not permitted to um, run my jobs on. So that's what the backfill partition is. So the next thing I want to do is to um, be able to utilize the virtual environment we created initially. So this part is called the, the loading of dependencies, right? So first thing we did was to module load our anaconda. And then the next thing we need to do is to activate that environment we created at first. So conda activate, um, it was camel case. Okay, so that's the third section. We um, the third section we just performed. So the next sec section is the job steps. What are the things we we would like to execute? What are the programs we want to execute? Are we going to execute things in parallel, or do we have just a single task to execute? So, and in order to do that, we can use the srun command for that. So the srun command can be used in both ways. It can be used within your Slurm script, and it it can be used um, to, um, you know, run jobs interactively. So um, I'm going to specify this flag, which can also be end tasks. It's just similar to what we have here. For well, here, um, I am explicitly saying that for this job step, I I regard this job step as one task, right? And then what is the program I would like to execute? I would like to execute my Python program. So that's, we use, we call the Python um, interpreter. And then um, what is the file we would like to execute um, for our project? And that is the program, the py file we specified initially. So now this is, this is all we need for our submission script. All right, so I'm gonna save this script. Just before I save it up, does anyone have any question regarding these um, parameters I have here? Okay, so I'll just save this script. And then next thing I would like to do is to um, write the code for our Python um, program. So I'll do a vi program or py. And just like we did before, I'm just going to import camel case, create a variable called um, okay, and then create my text file. I first and next I'm just gonna print this so C the um pass the text as an argument. Okay. So our uh, script looks good and now we are ready for submission. Okay, just to call my console. So now let's submit our bad script. Um, so if you take a look at what we have it, within this directory, we only have two files, right? And um, now let me submit the script. So we use the sbatch command to submit the scripts to the compute nodes. So if I do an sq quickly, uh, oh, okay, so here's my job. My job is running on the backfill partition. The name of the job, camel case, um, the user, the time, um, and then the node that is executing that job. I'm pretty sure it's done. Um, 
picture. I'm no longer on the queue. So I'm pretty sure our job failed. Let's see. So if I do a cut on the camel case the out file, which is the LP file. So this LP file could contain um, the actual result we are expecting from our Python program, or it could contain um, the errors. So if I do a cut, now it shows me that we have a problem and it says um, your shell has not been properly configured, blah, 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 blah. So this is because I currently have the module environment loaded in my own environment, in my own workspace. So there's a conflict going on somewhere. Because if I do the module list, it shows that, hey, I still have Anaconda loaded here and I'm using it within my slum script, right? So what I need to do is just to make sure that I purge my environment so it doesn't conflict with what I have on the slum script. So I'm gonna do a module purge just to get rid of that. And then if I run a module list again, um, it's all gone. Let me clear up my console so you can see. And now I'll submit this job again. But before I do that, let me delete this file. Great. So as batch, sorry, as batch. Script that SH. All right, let's skip. Okay, I wasn't fast enough. I guess it's done. If I do an ls and cut camel case that out. Now, um, our program was able to run successfully because you know it was able to capitalize every first word of this sentence. Um, and one thing I'd like to show you is if I run a sacked command, this just means slum accounting. If I run it on this job that I just submitted, I'm going to pass the J flag, which means job ID. So it shows me the statistics on how my, you know, job ran. So here is just, you know, the entire script and how many CPUs were actually allocated for this job. And then the batch section is the resource request section where we specify the different S batch directives and parameters for our job. So the places where we requested for the number of nodes, number of CPUs, number of memories. And I'm pretty not sure what this part, this part is quite new to me for the, this last part right here is actually the job step. That step that actually executed our Python program. And that's why you have the Python uh, specified in this step. Okay. Hey, Valentin. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. You got a question in the chat. Oh, it's okay. about the batch script. Okay. So should it be equal sign? Yeah, so um, say should it be a equal sign or a space? So you could use an equal sign or a space, either or both. It's still going to work as long as you just have a space before um, the value or you have an equal sign before the value. That's still going to work. All right, so we've, we've been able to successfully utilize um, our Condor environment within our slum script. Right, so, and this method applies to, um, like if you're working on an R project as well, um, it also applies to that. Um, so let me go back to the PowerPoint slide. Um, I think I went way ahead of the, the PowerPoint slide. So um, let's see. Yeah, so we looked at, you know, loading Anaconda module, activating the virtual environment, installing a package. And yeah, so let, let me talk about Condor channels, right? So um, depending on what library you're working on, we have several channels you know, where you could find different variants of packages or libraries. So if you're working on an R project, R projects have 
like their own specific channels where you could, you know, download packages from. If you're working on the Python um, Python project, there are also different channels like the conduct forge channel. So for example, if I do so let me go back to my script, my terminal, and um, I'm gonna do a conda activate. Oh sorry, let me load the conda first. Okay, so I'm going to activate my environment, this right here. Okay, so um, if I search for Condor search numpy, numpy. Now, it shows me a list of different numpy versions, right? And then if you if you look at the far right, that's a long list. It shows me the channel at which you can get, you know, that particular package from. So what if I say um, condor search, let me clear up my console. So what if I do a condor search numpy and then specify a channel name? So let's say condor Forge. So this is just going to search the Condor Forge channel to see the list of numpy versions we have in there. Um, and there are times where different channels will have different um, updated versions of um, packages. So um, this is helpful just to search and see where things are. And now we can see that we have different of channels where you define different NumP packages. So it, it's up to you whatever channel you'd like to choose from in installing. You know, whatever one works for you, that's fine. Okay, so I'm gonna drop this link real quick. Oops, sorry about that. Yeah, I mean, you're gonna have access to the file anyway, so. Yeah, so we took a look at um, we've 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 done all these. We've been able to you know use PIP to install the Camel case library. We've also launched our Python CLI and we've run this code just to see how it works. And we've been able to. <clears throat> so the last thing we need to look at is how we can remove um, environments, right? And how we can deactivate Conda environments, and how we can also remove packages from our environments. So, um, so just to recap, this shows that we are within this environment, right? And in order to exit this environment, we use the Condor deactivate, right? And it takes, up, takes us out of that environment. Now, what if we want to delete the entire environment? Maybe we don't need it anymore. We can use the Condor env, which we are specifying that, hey, I'm trying to perform an action on the environment itself. So Condor ENV remove. Okay, so I'm not just I'm not gonna remove it just yet. I need to cover something before this. Um, I need to cover how we can also clone environments, right? So if I need to, um, so let's say I have a different, um, I have an environment I created earlier. And this environment has its own versions of packages. And now um, I don't want to go over to install the same thing I already installed again for a new project. So I can just simply clone um, the entire project and have the same thing um, within the package. So the best way to do that is to first I'll do a conda env list just to be sure of the name of the package I have. So um, in order to clone, we're going to clone the camel case environment, right? So I can do a condor create the name of the environment I'm trying to create. So let's say SpaceX. So what am I trying to do? I'm trying to clone. 
So I'll specify the clone flag and then the actual environment I am trying to clone. So I'm trying to clone the camel case here. So it's in the cloning process. All right, so now it's done. Clear up my console. So now if I do a Conda ENV list, it shows me the list of, and it shows me the list of, um, it shows me the actual package we just created. We just cloned it out of the camel case. So now I can do a Conda activate just for you to see that it really worked. Conda activate space X. And now I can do a Conda list and it's going to have the same packages that were installed in the auto package so this makes your work faster you know rather than reinstalling the tons of libraries you installed earlier on you could just clone any of these like you could clone any of these right here so you want to create your own version of tensorflow and install extra packages and extra versions of software you could create anything um, you could clone any of these virtual environments to suit your own project requirements. So I'm going to do a condor deactivate. Yep. All right. So, so now we can take a look at how we can delete the condor virtual environment. And the best way to do that is just to use this command called condor env remove and then the name of the environment. So I'm just going to delete what we just cloned. So I'll do a condor env remove the name, which is spacex. And that's it. If I run a condor env list again, Um, I no longer have the SpaceX environment within um, the list of virtual environments here. Um, any questions so far? All right. So we just covered the cloning environment, you know, which saves your time and prevents you from re-downloading the entire package again. And also we took a look at how you could, you know, use um, the Condor environment you just created within your batch script, sorry. And we also looked at how we could create, um, you could run your uh, batch script against your program, your Python program, and also um, submit it to the compute node for processing. And um, these are resources you can find on the slides when you have access to it. Um, just to give you like the Condor cheat codes that you can utilize for your project. And also this actually shows you the list of Condor channels where you could you know, specify um, uh, several versions of tools or libraries you'd like to use for your project. And also this actually shows you how you could use um, our language with Anaconda as well. And um, that is the end of the workshop. Um, I think that was a quick one.